Alright guys, so welcome to the third lecture on network management and automation software development with Python. Uh, this lecture, I'm going to do uh, things a bit differently. I understand from the previous lectures, they were extremely long. I'm going to try to keep it uh, short and sweet. So today, what we're going to be doing, as I mentioned last class, is we're going to be going over the programming fundamentals and some of the practice problems uh, as well. Um, so uh, without any further delays, let's uh, jump right into it. Um, so of course, before I get started, I would just like to uh, remind everyone that uh, up till now, you guys should have received uh, five emails uh, from me. The latest one would be on lecture three release, programming fundamentals and practice problems. Um, so over here, I will just capture all the practice problems that um, uh, that I'm going to uh, uh, share uh, with you guys. So I would, uh, would request or and also recommend that you guys uh, work uh, on them. Okay. Um, for those of you who have not registered, please go ahead and register uh, using uh, this particular uh, link. Uh, I will uh, put it in the comment uh, in the description uh, below as well. So uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to be programming agnostic. Right. And the reason why uh, I said is because no matter um, whichever programming uh, language uh, you're talking about, your some of the statements, some of the logic would be the same. Right. So as a software developer, it's very important to understand how you're going to code something. Coding is the easy part. Right. Uh, coding just uh, depends on sort of getting practice. Right. So uh, if you practice a lot, of course, you'll be more proficient at it. Right. So we'll go through all of these. Um, uh, examples uh, well most of them um, and um, and then we'll be very agnostic in terms of um, uh, language I won't be focusing on a particular language I'll be just very agnostic in this lecture and the next lecture when we uh, start uh, uh, with actual coding then we'll focus on uh, Python right um, but I want to add uh, some of the examples so for example let me I'm just I'm jumping ahead um, so when we get to the uh, question answers. So there will be 10 question answers. Um, I mean, questions uh, that you guys uh, will uh, need to solve. Uh, but these two are the ones that I'll be covering on the next class because we will be building our application on top of this, right? So for example, this is uh, a question, for example, files are backed up using the following name. So for example, let's say you're using a monitoring system, it's called PRTG or something like that. Um, and this is the format that is saving in, right? So how can you write an application which uh, creates a string to match all of these uh, names, right? So anyways, um, so yeah, even though uh, I'm being very ag uh, agnostic in terms of uh, the program that I'll be covering, it's very important for you guys to understand the logic, right? Because if you understand the logic, no matter what programming language you uh, work with, you'll be a joke, right? Literally, <laughs> it'll be very easy. It's just a matter of understanding the syntax, right? As you guys will see. Um, so I'll be covering very easy three examples just so everyone gets an idea. Um, and as I said, uh, I will be emailing uh, some practice uh, questions, right? Uh, to those of you who have registered. So again, yeah, if you have not registered, please go ahead, uh, click here and register. Our registration is absolutely free. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, uh, starting with, okay, uh, with the programming fundamentals, right? So what is a programming language? Right um, now, before uh, okay, let's even forget about programming language. Let's talk about a language, right? So, for example, uh, like what is a language, right? So, for for an example, I'm speaking to you guys in English, right? So, a language is a way to communicate, right? Um, so, I'm using that to communicate with you, right? Now, when it comes to a programming language, now a programming language is a way to communicate with a computer, with a system. Right. Um, I, I know for those of you who are coming from a, a computer engineering background, uh, I know it's a bit more complicated that, than that because uh, whether you have an interpreter or a compiler, then it can, gets converted into a machine code. Um, so, of course, I'm not going to go into that level of detail right now, uh, but just being very agnostic. So a programming language is a way to communicate with a computer. Now, similarly, we have so many languages, right? We have English, we have French, we have Urdu, we have Arabic, we have uh, German, right? Similarly, there are different, different types of programming language. So for example, C++, Java, HTML is not a programming language, um, uh, SQL, PHP, uh, Visual Basic, C Sharp. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many, right? Uh, Python is what we're covering. 
So uh, that's just different ways of communicating. Now, each one, of course, has uh, their strength and weakness, right? Um, so in, uh, in the next lecture, when we focus on Python, I'll explain what uh, an interpreter is. And of course, as I said, I'm, we're not gonna focus on the mechanics of how programming language works, uh, but it's good to have just like a five minute overview in terms of, okay, what is the difference between a programming language that's interpreted versus something that's compiled, right? So for example, with C++, uh, C and stuff like that. Right. So a programming language is a way to communicate with a computer. Right. And a computer program, all it is, is a collection of instructions. Right. Which are supposed to do a specific task. Right. Um, and these programming languages are used to write those particular instructions. Right. So an example of that is, for example, Notepad++ or GNS3 or um, any other application, software application you're using. Uh, someone, uh, when you click on something, it is telling the program, I mean, it is telling the computer to do a per particular uh, task. Right. So that's uh, what it is. Now, just like in any language, for example, in English, you start writing your sentences uh, from left to right, right? So for example, if you look at uh, Arabic, you're start, you're going to start writing um, your uh, sentences, uh, your sentence fragments from left to, uh, sorry, from right to left in this case, right? So each language has its specific syntax, right? Uh, a, and they have their own format, right? Um, now, similarly with computer program, they have their own particular uh, syntax and format, right? So um, all of the programs, they'll have their own uh, particular syntax, right? So a syntax and format is essentially, um, you can think of it as language rules, right? And essentially it's a combination of a set of rules that are used to write a program, right? So on the right side, we see over here, uh, we have uh, JavaScript, uh, right? So over here, we're declaring a variable and then we're printing out something to the console, right? Over here, we have, uh, I believe, C, um, and we are um, uh, calling a library, uh, writing a function and doing a particular task, right? So it's just, so whatever programming language you use, for example, if you want to learn English, you would first uh, understand how you uh, string together a sentence, right? Understand the meaning, um, and then you would start writing, right? So um, the same, same, exact same idea here, right? You're just now learning a language to talk to a computer. Then uh, the next is, uh, and again, I'm being very uh, agnostic in terms of programming, as you guys all know this. Uh, the next is uh, variables and data types, right? So um, before uh, I talk about even the variables and data types and memory and all of that, um, when us as humans, right, when we need to save something, um, what do we do, right? We commit it in our brain, right? We are committing it in our memory, right? So for example, I know back in the old days when we didn't have smartphones, we had uh, notebooks, I would have all my friends' numbers memorized, right? <laughs> it's kind of crazy now that I think about it, but yeah, that's how it was back in the days, right? So essentially what was what was happening in the background is uh, that num those numbers are being committed to uh, my head. So for example, if I wanted to retrieve uh, Gordon Freeman's number, that number, I would retrieve that number from my brain, right? It's somewhere located in the brain, right? Brain has uh, some amazing algorithm, right? Similarly, uh, when we when it comes to program, uh, there are something called variables, right? And essentially, a variable is a temporary location in memory to store data, right? So each computer, of course, it has a memory, right? It has CPU, it has memory, right? And the combination of those two is called compute, right? So um, whatever. So let me actually draw and illustrate, and hopefully that would make uh, more sense. So let's say you have your you have your memory, okay? Uh, let's say this is uh, from here to here, let's say this is eight uh, gigabyte or something, right? Now, uh, what happens in this memory is when you're loading up and uh, when you launch an application, it's of course loaded into the memory, right? But let's not talk about that. Um, what happens is when you're saving something in, uh, when you're writing a program and when you're saving a variable, it gets saved in some location of the memory, right? So for example, in this location. And this location will have some address, right? So let's say X, Y, Z, right? Now let's say a program, it needs to uh, get this uh, variable, whatever variable you have saved here, right? Let's say you dec declare a variable uh, A and then you say, okay, the value is five. Right. So what's going to happen is in memory, that's going to be saved. Right. So let's say five. Right. And since this is an integer, so I'll talk about data types. 
uh, in a bit. So now this is being stored in memory. Now, how is a program referencing this? Right, it's referencing by a memory address. Right, um, and that's how it gets uh, the value that is uh, saved. Okay, so that's what a variable is. Um, now, a data type is what type of data is that variable storing, right? So um, when it comes to human beings, you don't, of course, have to define it. Everything is being done dynamically, right? So for example, let's say if someone had said something, right, a voice, right, that is saved in your memory, you can recall it. You don't have to declare the data type, right? If you're memorizing a number, you don't have to uh, declare a data type. Right, it's like it's kind of fasc fascinating how our brain works. Anyways, um, so similarly, when you have uh different uh you have different types of uh data that you want to store, um uh in memory, right? So for example, you can have uh, characters, you can have strings, you can have integers, you can have floats, right? And you can also have objects, right? So we'll talk about that when we focus uh start focusing on object oriented programming language, um, and essentially this data could be anything, right? So what happens is let's say you are so in this case let's say this is this is a data type and this is called integer right um so what the computer program is going to define is that okay integer can have a value between uh, a all the way to z right and this is particular number right and then it will also know that okay how much space do i need to save this particular uh, to save any integer value in memory, right? So based on that, it will find that empty space in memory, and then it will save that information there as well, right? So a lot of things um, are happening in the background as well. Okay, the next is um, operators, right? So what is an operator? I'm sure everyone uh, would know. Uh, the operator is essentially a, a character that represents a particular action, right? Um, and again, in programming language, there are different types of operators, the four of which I will go through. Um, the first one we'll go through is arithmetic, then we'll go over assignment, then we'll go over comparison, and then finally we'll go over logical operators. So an arithmetic operator, um, these everyone should be familiar with. So for example, let's say if you want to add uh, two numbers together, right? Or if you want to add two integers together, right? You would use uh, these arithmetic uh, operators, right? I mean, uh, for add, you'd use this. For subtraction, you'd use this. For multiplication is this. For division is this, right? Um, if you want to do exponent, uh, these are the uh, symbols. Now, of course, it may differ from programming language to programming language, but generally speaking, this is uh, the the format uh, that you would use, right? Uh, the one thing I want to cover is the modulus operator, okay? And what a modulus operator does is it uh, it um, gives the remainder, right? So, for example, the one of the exercises that we'll do today will be utilizing modulus. So, I'm giving you guys a hint. So just to demonstrate what it is, is let's say you're dividing two numbers. So let's say two and 10, right? Now you know that two times five is 10 and you would get zero over here, right? Now the result of this is five, but the remainder is zero, right? So if you want to get the remainder, what you would do is you would use the modulus, right? So for example, let's say if I was to say uh, divide equals to five divided, oh sorry, uh, 10 divided by 2, right? So the, the result that will be saved in div is 5, okay? Now, if I was to do the same thing, and if I was to say 10 modulus 2, now what it would save is, it will save the remainder, in this case 0, okay? So one of the exercises that we'll go through uh, where you have to uh, find out whether a number is even or odd, we're going to use this, right? Because we know even numbers are uh, are divisible by 2, so the remainder will always be 0, right? So we can use that particular condition to uh, differentiate whether a number is even or odd. Okay, um, and again, I'm giving very simple examples. And uh, when, you, when we go to progress through the code, you'll see how these simple examples, how you can divide all of these complicated problems into simple, simple logical uh, steps, right? So that's why I want, I'm giving these simple uh, examples. The next is assignment operator, okay? And essentially, assignment operator, what you're doing is you're assigning something somewhere, right? So for example, we have the equals to uh, assignment operator, right? So what this means is, for example, in our example, what we did was we said, whatever the result of this is, it's equal to div, right? Now div has the value, whatever this is evaluated to, right? In this case, five, right? So that's what um, 
equal to uh, stands for, right? Um, the second is add and equal to, right? Um, so this is essentially, uh, so the, the rest of them are essentially shortcut. I'll cover add and equal to, and then you can extrapolate the rest. So for example, if you're doing, uh, or here, if you're doing uh, a, because our variable over here is uh, equals to five. So if I do a, it's equals to a plus, let's say one or something, right? So instead of uh, writing this, uh, the, instead of writing this repetitively, uh, the programmers, they have uh, come up with a short solution where you just simply write a plus equals to one, right? So this is a short form of writing a plus equals to uh, a equals to a plus one, right? So, uh, so this is essentially exactly what uh, this would do. It's just more conven convenient uh, way to uh, sort of write it, right? So exact same ideas you have on the other side where you have add and equal to subtract equal to multiplication and equal to divide and equal to modulus and equal to power and equal to, right? Or exponential and equal to. Okay, then we come to the logical operators, right? Um, and of course, you guys will be using this a lot um, uh, because programming is a bunch of logic that's working together, right? So there are three logics. There's the AND operator, there's the OR, and there's the NOT, okay? So these operators, essentially, what happens is, let's say um, you have two variables, right? Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say B is equals to five, um, and you have C, is equals to uh, five as well, okay? So what you can do is uh, you can, and let's say you want to write a logic where you're comparing these two and you're checking whether they're the same or not, right? So what you can do is um, you can say if B is equal to, um, let's say equal to equal to five and, okay, I'll, I'll skip the particular, and C is equals to equals to five. Right. So in this case, when what is happening is you for this to be true, what happens is this part has to be true and this part has to be true as well. Right. That's that's what and is. Right. So. Uh, so essentially, if you guys have um, if you guys have taken uh, logical programming, so the and function, it looks something like this. Right. So you have. Oops, sorry about that. Let me draw it out here. So you have your input, right? So for example, let's say your first input is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then finally, you have 1 and 1, right? So let's say this is the AND table, right? So now for AND to be true, what ha has to happen is both the conditions have to be true, right? So in this case, uh, in programming 1, uh, any value that's uh, not 0, that, that's equal to true. So in this case, let's say we have 1 and 1. So this means that this is true right this will be false right because you have one false right so for this condition to be true yeah both of them have to be true similarly you have false here and false here now when it comes to uh, or operator so again you have zero zero input uh, zero one one zero and one one right now in or operator um, either one of the conditions could be true and the output would be true right so in this case this is true this is true this is true, but this is false, right? This is true because you have at least one condition that is true, right? So in our example, when we had uh, B is equals to equals to five and C is equals to equals to five, right? So for this um, statement to be true, both of these conditions have to match, right? So in this case, the answer would be true, right? Um, but let's say, if we had instead of uh, and over here, if we had b is equals to equals to five, or c equals to equals to ten, right? So now if we evaluate this, we said b is equals to five, right? And then we said c equals to five as well, right? So in this case, this is true, right? And then we have or, and then but this is false, right? Because c is equals to five. Um, and then we have two equals two. So I'll go where this compares and equal to. But in this case, we're not evaluating. We're saying that, okay, is this equals to uh, 10, right? So in this case, this is false, right? But now, so you have two inputs. You have true or false, right? Now, uh, so you have one or zero, right? So one or zero is equals to true. So the answer for this will be true as well, right? So this logic would be true, 
okay now the last logic now again uh, this will make more and more sense when you start actually coding right uh, so we'll go through those examples the last one is logical not right not is like an inverse right so for example if you have if you have uh, actually let me ask you a question so um if if i say uh, I'll, I'll let you guys solve this actually zero not equal to zero is this true or is this false okay so i'll leave this to you guys but essentially what not does is it inverses um uh, whatever uh, the operation is right uh, the next is comparison right so uh, in the previous example i used double equals to right whereas in this example i use one equal to right so the difference between this is over here you're assigning when i say a, a when i say a is equal to five that means the value of a is five now over here if i was to say a is equals to equals to five then in that case whatever the value of a is is going to compare with five right so this is used for comparison okay um, another example is not equals to right so for example if we were to do i'll leave that this example with you guys but let's say if i was to say uh, five is not equals to two is this true or false right five is not equals to two which is true right because five is not equals to two right now if i said five actually i <laughs> i won't talk about that because i want you guys to uh, solve this particular uh, one okay now similarly you have um uh, uh greater than uh operator right so if you're comparing two um variables and you're checking whether something is greater than right so then you would use this operator if it's less than then you would use this right greater than or equal to you would use this right less than or equal to you would use this operator okay so again we'll go through these examples um, then we have something called decision makers, right? Um, and decision makers are essentially just saying if else, uh, if this is true, then do this. If this else, do this, right? So if you have just one condition, then you would just say, okay, if a particular condition is met, then do this particular task. Um, but if you want to have like if and then else, like um, uh, in terms of, okay, do the remainder of the task, then you would have if do this, else do that, right? Um, and then continue with the program. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have an if condition. So you have your, sorry about that. So if you have your if condition, so you say if something, some condition over here that you're evaluating, right? So if this is true, then do this particular task, right? Um, so that's what it will do. So your program, let's say your program starts from here, then it uh, reaches this if condition then it continues down here right so this if condition will just execute this and after it's done it will continue executing it executing the rest of the code now if you were to introduce else if you just have one more condition so you can have another condition and it could execute this right and then you can it will execute the rest of the program right so if the first condition is met so if let's say this condition is met then it would do this right but if it's not ma matched then it will do this particular condition, right? No matter what. Um, and in else, you don't really need a condition because you're saying, okay, uh, and else if you would have that, right? So I apologize for this. Yeah, so you don't have a condition. So if this is not matched, then you would do this, right? Now you have something else, which is um, where you would need this condition is let's say if you have another condition, else if, right? Um, so if you're comparing that, okay, you do some particular logic here if this matches then do this if it doesn't match then check if this matches right if it matches then do this right um, and then finally what you can have is you can have else right um, and if none of the conditions match over here then just do execute this uh, particular thing and then continue on with the rest of the code right so these are some of the logical um, uh, decision maker uh, tools that you guys uh, would be using right uh, switch statements is uh, something similar i won't go into too much detail but essentially you're just uh, matching different cases um, and then based on that you're doing a particular task so maybe when we uh, start with python I'll, I'll talk about that now the next is loops right so no matter what programming language you go through you'll have some kind of uh, loop right um, and there are two types of loops and essentially loops are uh, used to do repetitive tasks right um, and uh, there are two types of loop there's a while loop and there's a for loop 
right? While loop you use when you don't know how many times you have to go through a particular um, item, right? Whereas for loop you would go through, uh, you would use when you know how many times you're going to go through a particular item. Okay, so for an example, let's say we have um, uh, a condition where we're asking a user for input. So we say, hey, user, um, uh, ask for input. Oh, sorry. Right now, what we're asking the user is to uh, enter up an integer, right? Ask um, in for 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 number input or something, right? So now, as a user, uh, you know, human beings they can make mistakes, right? Um, so now, instead of inputting a number here, they're inputting uh, alphanumerical numbers, right? So a one or something like that, right? So now this is not a valid input. If you were to take this input and put it in your program, your program may crash. Right. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll talk about exception handling and all of that. But so in this case, you don't know how many times you're going to ask the user till they enter the right answer. Right. So in this case, you will run the while loop. You'll say, OK, keep on asking this question until the user has input um, something, which is a number. Or, or an integer right so that's where a while loop would be used right whereas with a for loop uh, you would use for loop when you're iterating through something right so for an example um, over here uh, we'll talk about what arrays are uh, when we talk about data structures so in this case let's say we have um, um, uh, a continuous ar uh, arrays arrays right so we'll talk about that sorry i'm jumping ahead a bit so in an array you know how many uh, how what size uh, what how, how size oh, Sorry, uh, you know in an array the size of the array, right? So you know that, okay, this is how many times you need to iterate through it, right? So in that case, you would use uh, the for loop, right? And uh, now, in an, uh, now this is a format that some programming languages use. Python, it uses a different syntax, right? So we'll go over that. But essentially, you have some initialization. You'll know, okay, this is how many times you're going to count. And then you can either increment or decrement, right? And again, I said in Python, it's, it's different. So we'll talk about that. Right. So which brings me to arrays. Uh, right. So array is essentially a collection of values. OK. So what that means is. We up till now, we had um, just a particular variable that we were storing. Right. So, for example, if we have uh, a and then we're storing five. Right. Now, let's say if we're uh, if we want to store a collection of these. Right. So instead of having a is equals to this, b equals to one, c equals to ten, d equals to fifteen. What you can do is you can have an array. So you can say uh, your array is x. Right. And this over here, you can save these values. So five, one, ten, fifteen. OK. And what the program does is in in uh, in memory. So all of this, again, is saved in memory. Right. Now, what your programming language does is it's instead of saving all of these in a particular um, uh, uh, location in a memory, it saves this variable here. So let's say it saves it here. And the memory location for this is, let's say, A, B, and C. OK, now, so that is uh, being saved in a continuous location in memory, right? Now, let's say if you want to access uh, this variable, right? So let's say 15, right? So we know that it's in the uh, uh, fourth. Uh, site right so the first uh, the first um, component is represented by zero then one then two and three so if I wanted to retrieve this the last uh, variable what I would say is I would say x and then square bracket three and this would return 15 okay in Python you'll see that uh, you're, there are some cooler ways of doing it so for example you can say um, you can use a negative, right? Because uh, in Python, you have this, and then you have negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, right? So you can refer to this as negative 1, and you'll always get the last value, right? But again, we'll talk about this when we start talking about Python. OK, so that's what arrays. It's a continuous um, uh, um, information uh, of uh, items, right? Now, in this case, um, when you talk about C, C++, you can have uh, an array of just particular integers, uh, or just particular data types, right? Whereas in Python, you can have um, you can have a combination of strings, objects, um, uh, integers, uh, a lot of things in one, right? So yeah, so those are some of the things uh, that we'll explore as well. Then we uh, finally come to functions, OK? And what is a function? Uh, a function is essentially a group of uh, uh, code um, joined together, right? Um, in Or packaged in a nice way. So for an example, so even before we talk about a function, if you remember from uh, your math math class, right? So you have some something like this. So f of x is equals to x 
plus 1. Okay, so in this case, what, what are we doing? We have a function, right? We have defined it by f of x, right? And we're saying, okay, this is what's inside a function, right? So now let's say if I want to uh, put some value. So if I want to say f of 5, so what's going to happen? 5 is going to be substituted in x over here, right? So it will be 5, oops, it will be 5 plus 1, okay? Now, once this is evaluated, then it's going to return the result. So f of 5 would equals to 6. Right? So it's returning the result, right? Now, similarly, uh, in maths, we're just grouping together this um, inside our function, right? Uh, in programming language, you have the same concept. What you're doing is you're grouping together um, a bunch of code inside here, right? And then you can have a particular input, and then it can give you a particular output, right? So, um, so for example, if you're doing a task repetitively, right? Um, if you're maybe uh, in your code, you're asking a user for input in different locations, you can have that particular code, say that uh, asking user for input, and then you can have any um, uh, uh, um, checksums, right? So for example, you can say, okay, do this until, or you can have any logic in here, right? And you can group that together inside this particular function. And uh, what would happen is uh, then you just simply call this function. So you don't have to copy paste five, six lines of code every single time you're asking for an input, right? So um, of course, um, so uh, when so first you have to create a uh, to create a function you have to uh, define a function name right you have to pass in a particular uh, value I mean you don't have to but in this case let's say we are right in this case we passed five right um, and then we called that function right how did we call it we said f of five right so that function gets called and then it also returned a value right so again these are uh, optional uh, and it depends on what programming language you use and that's what syntax uh, you would be uh, compliant with okay. Uh, the next is keywords. Now, in any programming language, there are some uh, keywords that are reserved, right? And those, uh, you cannot use them to name a function. You cannot use them to name a variable or any other things, right? So, for example, in Python, you have the def keyword, which is used to define the function, right? Um, so, you cannot use that. You have true, false, class. All of these fun uh, keywords are there, So, um, uh, which, are, uh, which are meaningful in Python. Like, this does something, right? This is an if statement, right? Uh, this is a false statement this is how you start a class this is logical and this is logical not this is else right else if so all of these they have some meaning in python right so you cannot use these in when you're defining your variables or functions and or any other task right so you can only use this for um for for their their purpose that they're meant for okay so yeah each programming language they have some particular keywords that you just have to be familiar with right since we're focusing on python that's what we're focusing on Okay, and then finally you have um, file input, output, and database. I mean, of course, there are lots of other topics. Um, now, when it comes, so up till now, what have you been doing? So whenever we have to save information, we are saving it in memory, right? Right. So we're saving information in memory uh, here, here, here. Right. Whenever you're loading the program, the program loads in memory. Now, what happens if the computer crashes? Right. Okay. Actually, let's forget about computer crashing. Now, let's say if you want to persist some data, right? Because memory is volatile, right? So if you shut it down, if you shut down the computer, everything that's in the memory is gonna go away, right? Unless you put it on standby. I mean, that's a different story. But if, let's say if your computer crashes, right? Then of course everything that you've saved in memory is going to go away, right? So what you have to do is to persist all this information, you have to save it in a file. Right. So you can save the information on a file. Right. And this gets uh, stored in uh, on your hard disk. Right. Or another thing you can use is you can store information in, in a database. Right. Um, and database, for example, there's SQL and other databases. Um, now, database provides a very nice structured format um, to store and retrieve and organize data, right? So these are some of the things that we'll be using uh, when we uh, work on the project. But uh, yeah, if you want your uh, store, uh, your information, your variables and other things, information to be persisted, then you would use um, SQL database or some file and then you would read and write to the file, right? Now, of course, uh, you won't read and write everything to the file because reading and writing to a file is a slow process, right? So um, only for the information that you want to persist, of course, then you would uh, use uh, save it in the data uh, in the uh, SQL, right? Uh, and then there are other things, for example, memcache, which will help you uh, store variables inside the data. So we'll talk about uh, all of those. Okay, so now that we talked about uh, these agnostic terms, now how do you start um, uh, thinking like a programmer, right? Because 
as I said, writing the code is the easy part, right? Coming up with the logic, that's the hard part, right? Um, so as a programmer, what you have to do is you have to think critically, right? So for example, if I was to give you a screw and I will tell you, if I was to tell you, okay, can you uh, put this screw in on this wall, right? Now you can use a hammer to hammer that screw inside the wall, right? That would work. Or you can use a screwdriver to um, rotate and uh, put it in uh, that way, right? So that would also work, right? So it really depends on how you're thinking. You have to be very critical in the way you think. You have to think about um, uh, what are some of the user problems that you can have, right? Um, what can user do? How can the program crash, right? Um, uh, and then based on that, you write your logic, right? Um, and the second is, uh, which is very important, is whenever you're given a particular task, right? Uh, initially, it may look very daunting, right? It may look very scary. But essentially, what you have to do is you have to break down that problem into smaller, smaller pieces, and then you solve it, right? Now, when you go to an interview, they'll be like, oh, can you uh, can you uh, write the algorithm for this, right? Now, of course, those you have to memorize, which is kind of ridiculous if you ask me, because no one would ever, I mean, I don't know who memorizes, right? I don't have that much capacity. I mean, I don't want to waste capacity in my brain to memorize algorithm. But essentially, whenever you're writing um, uh, a logic, right, in the first go, it doesn't have to be like 100% efficient, right? It doesn't have to be the most uh perfect algorithm right but when you iterate through it once or twice first get the logic down and after you iterate through it and then you try to make it more efficient right um so yeah that's um uh, i mean yeah so we'll talk about that um and then anticipate some of the changes in the future right so think about okay in the future what could possibly happen right so for example if you're working for a business you can think of okay what could happen possibly in the future that i may need to think about and add into the program right because when you think about all of this right so for example let's say you're writing a code right and uh initially let's say you haven't implemented any logging systems right so when you're writing the code then you have to think about okay how can you, uh, uh, you maybe you just leave it uh, the logging system for future right so when you revisit the code after like a couple of months when you have released your first uh, release then when you because when you already thought about that okay these are the things i want to add you're already think, going to think about when you write the code that okay what are the, some of the things i need to take into consideration right so then implementing that same logic wouldn't be difficult like integrating it with your program right so it's very important to anticipate change in the future uh, when you're writing uh, or like to think at the programmer, right? And then the final last step is, of course, you have to practice, right? No matter if you don't practice, uh, there is no way you're going to be proficient in anything at all, right? So this goes uh, with any facets of life. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is pseudocode and flowchart. And uh, right now it may sound very useless and very boring, but let me explain why this would be, uh, why this is um, important, right? Because when we talk about just a single thread, then okay, fine, everything is very simple, uh, very, very simple, easy to understand. But when you're talking about multi-threading, right, when you have multiple threads, right, then in that case, uh, or at least when you even go to your workplace, like right, these are some of the things that you will see at architect's level, architect level, right? Um, in terms of, okay, when is the second thread starting what are the logic is doing uh, how to make sure there are no thread locks and stuff like that right so um, of course we won't uh, go into that much of detail in just this one slide I mean in this particular uh, lecture but just to give you uh, guys the building blocks um, so first is the pseudocode right now before you start writing a program right as I said you have to write the logic Right now, you don't have to write the logic in terms of program. You can write it in, in your language, in, in English, in Arabic, or whatever it is, right? So your what that will help you is to break down that problem logically, right? So then, um, then what you can do is you can implement that step by step uh, on your code. Okay, so that's the code. So we'll we'll do this in the practice in the next couple of slides. And flowcharts is uh, essentially a visual representation of sequence of steps, right? So for example, in your program, if let's say you're starting something, you would use these. If the, how the program is flowing, you would use this. Input for input or output, you would use this. For decision making, you would use this. For processing, you would use this, right? Now again, this will make sense when we uh, start working on the program. And of course, you can refer back to this uh, to uh, to work on your practice problems as well. So these are some of the toolkits. Uh, now, this is what you have in your toolkit, right? You know what a variable is, you know what an op operator is, you know what decision makers are, you know what loops are, you know what arrays are. Now, using this, let's try to um, do some examples, okay? So starting from the very simple example, which is adding two numbers, okay? So 
going uh, over here, uh, starting on the right side, I've already uh, written down the flowchart, right? So in this case, we just want to add two numbers together, which is entered by a user, right? So for example, first we're starting the program, right? Then we declare variables, right? Because the that's where the user is going to, uh, that's where we have to save the information, right? So we declare the variables. We call the first variable number one, second variable number two, and then we want to save that result somewhere in a variable. So you would call that, we will call that sum, okay? So then, uh, for after we have declared this variable, then what we're going to do is we're going to ask user for the input. So we're reading number one, number two. When the user inputs it, it's going to be saved in these variables, and then it's being processed. So you have these uh, rectangle, right? So a plus b is, or in in this case, num one plus num two, right? Uh, and that is being saved in sum, right? And then we're displaying the result uh, over here, right? Uh, and then we're stopping the program, right? So if you were to write a pseudocode. How would the pseudocode uh, look like? So first, we're going to say um, we're going to say declare three variables. Okay, I'm gonna say num one, num two, and then sum. Okay, and then I would say ask user for input. Okay, and then the uh, uh, in this case uh, the input would be num one, num two, right? Um, and after that, what we're going to do is since we want to add, then what we're going to do is we're going to say add num one and num two and save it. Sorry, save it in some variable okay and then finally I will say display the result right so when you write this now of course there's a very simple uh, example but when we talk about complex logic right you of course you won't think in like a programming term right so you have to think in your logical way however you think right so for example in this case we're declaring uh, variables right so you can easily understand that as user for input we can understand that add numbers we can understand that just uh, show the sum uh, uh, I mean uh, say add it and save it in a sum variable we can we can understand that and then finally we have the display the result right so all of this we can uh, very easily logically understand so now what you can do is you can take this and you can go to any programming language and you can implement these right now again as I said in a programming language your syntax would be different your formatting would be different but the logic will stay the same right so that's our first example let's go over the second example the second example is uh, find the largest number amongst the three different numbers okay so what we have is we have uh, three uh, variables a b and c and what we want to do is we want to find the largest number out of all of them right so what are we doing here we're reading a b and c over here right and then we're going through a logic. We're saying that okay, um, or let's let's go through uh, without going into the flowchart. Let's go through the logic ourselves, right? So in in our case, let's say if I give you two uh, three numbers, right? So let's say if I give you five, right, and I give you uh, one, and then I give you ten, okay. Now you have to find out which is the largest number out of all of these, right? So logically, what would you do, right? You would take this five, you would compare it with this, okay. And if it's greater than this, right? So then like, you know how you're thinking in your brain, I automatically use an English if, right? So first what I'll do is I will compare, um, I, I'm going to say compare uh, five and one, right? And then I'm gonna say if five is greater than one, greater than one, then, uh, then in this case, let's say I'll take five, right? Else, I'm going to say that uh, take one, right? Because that's the only conditions we have, right? And then what I'm going to do is wherever I save this five, let's say I save it somewhere, right? Uh, then what I'm going to do is I need to compare whatever the result from this, right? I need to save and then compare it. So let's say it's five, of course, right? Then I'm going to compare it with the last variable, right? And then the exact same steps, right? So I'll say compare five with 10, right? And then again, I have the condition. So if, um, if uh, 
5 greater than 10 do something else do something right so this is the logic as you can see i'm just writing it out in pure uh, english right so similarly over here we have the same logic now right so first you're declaring variables right you're reading the input from user a b and c right um and then what are you doing first you're comparing a and b right so you compare a and b right now if a is uh bigger than b then what you're going to do is it's true right so this is the if condition so now this is true then of course the last variable that you're going to compare it with is a and c right so that's what you have here right now in this case let's say if a is bigger then you have to of course going to you're going to say okay print a otherwise you're going to say uh print c right because c is the last one right now if let's say if you compare a and b and b is bigger right so in this case then you're going to compare b and c together right and then again you're going to have another if condition where you're comparing these two and if b is bigger then you're going to print uh, b otherwise you're going to print c and then you stop the program right so that's the logic again so yeah i'd like you guys to uh practice this uh write the pseudocode uh think of uh, uh, uh like try to pause the video try try it to yourself like take a piece of paper just scribble it just so you guys understand right it's very important to um so you see how um i broke down the problem instead of just taking variables i took two numbers and first i thought okay if i have five if i have ten and if i have seven right now how can i find out how can i possibly find out which is greater right so logically speaking i'll take this number i'll compare it with this i'll compare it with this right um or like break bringing it down i would compare it with this i mean there are multiple ways of solving the same problem right and then whatever is greater than these two that i'm going to compare it with this right so um that's the logic right so it's 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 very important for you guys to break down the problems in small small steps okay now the last example is <clears throat> find the number entered by a user i mean sorry uh, a user enter uh, enters a number and what you have to do is you have to find whether a number is even or odd Okay, so I give a hint, right? Any integer that uh, cannot be divisible, is not divisible by two, um, is uh, an odd integer, right? So what that means is, if you have a look at, um, uh, for example, a, a, a even number is 10, right? So uh, how can you check this condition? If you divide it by two, then the remainder is zero, right? So that's the logic, correct? Now, if I was to do the same thing, if I was to do seven, Right, and this is odd, right? So I, so uh, whatever um, uh, number I choose, right? So for example, if I uh, three here, the remainder is not zero; it's one, right? So, and of course, then this is odd, right? So what you can do is you can use this condition to evaluate whether your, uh, whether the user has input, uh, whatever they have input, whether it's true or false, right? So what you can do is in pseudocode, you can say, uh, ask user for input, ask user for input right and then what i would say is um i'm just going to write in in pure english divide um input by two okay and then i'm going to say uh, as we discussed right so if result is is equal to um zero right that what does that mean that means it's even right else because there is no other condition if it's not even then it's odd right else odd okay so if i was to write so that's the logic right now in programming as i said uh, that if you want to find the remainder you have to use something called modulus right so when you're actually coding we're going to be using modulus uh, but we'll talk about that later so in terms of coding uh, what would you have you would have uh, first of all you would uh, start Okay, uh, just to uh, make it quicker, I will just use my pen. So first you're going to start the program, right? Um, and then what you're doing is you're declaring variables. Okay, so declare variables. Um, and in this case, I will just say num1 and then result. Okay, um, and then afterwards, of course, we have to in, uh, read the input. So we're reading the input. So read input and save it in num1. Okay, and after that, uh, what we're doing is we're actually doing the processing, right? So in this case, the process is num1. 
Now, instead of divide, I'm going to use modulus 2. And then I'm going to say, um, sorry, I will draw it out here afterwards. I'm going to say, this is my if condition, right? I'm going to say, um, if, because now it's saving, um, and I'm going to save this in result variable, right? So now I'm going to compare if result, result is equals to equals to zero, then print, Um, print even else so I'll just say true here else if it's not even then print odd over here so this would be uh, false right so instead of this it would be false f right so that's the uh, the logic uh, that we uh, that would uh, be there for the program right <clears throat> So uh, what I've done is, um, uh, actually, yeah, before I get, get to that, I want to emphasize on one thing, which is code efficiency, right? Now, of course, when you write a program from complete scratch, it doesn't mean that it will be efficient from the get-go, right? So for example, if we revisit this example over here, right? What are we doing, right? In each step, when we're defining a code, when we're defining a particular line, it is uh, doing a particular instruction. Right? I mean, uh, it's following a particular instruction, right? Now, of course, we want to make sure it's as it's written in as less instruction as possible, right? So instead of uh, this, what you can have is you can cut down this step. What you can say is you can declare variables, right? You can read the input, right? And then instead of having this step where you're saving the sum inside, um, inside, uh, I mean, sorry, if you're, you're saving the result inside the sum, what you can do is you can have um, uh, you can skip this step and you can say print sum a plus b or print just a plus b, right? So that would skip this. What it would do is it would save a space in memory, right? And it will sa uh, save the CPU uh, cycles as well, right? So that's what it means over here by code efficiency, right? Now, of course, uh, right off the bat, your code won't be efficient. That's why I just said, okay, write the code as however um, inefficient it is. And afterwards, then you start writing the code. Uh, you try to make it more efficient, right? Because as I said over here, each line of code, it turns uh, those lines into instructions for the CPU, right? And CPU is now performing those instructions, right? Now to increase, um, now as uh, the longer code you have, the more instructions CPU has to do, right? So what you want to do is you want to write your code in such an optimal way where it's as efficient as possible. Uh, possible in as less lines as possible. But again, don't do this right off the bat. First, write the logic, make sure it works. And then from there onwards, see, okay, how can you improve it? What kind of new algorithms you can use and stuff like that, right? So now, of course, it's uh, your turn. Um, now, before I give, um, so you guys would have gotten an email. Um, now, before I, um, uh, before you guys get started with those, what I want to emphasize is, is what I want to emphasize is I want you guys to work on it without looking at Google. Don't Google it. Uh, use your logic. How would you uh, solve those problems, right? And what I'm going to do, uh, what I'm doing, of course, uh, is for the people who have subscribed, um, uh, who are supporting me, I'm having a one-on-one uh, -on -one session with them. So I'm going to go over uh, all the questions. I'm having private classes with them, and I'm going to make sure they understand everything um, uh, uh, properly right as much as um, uh, possible right so they're uh, maximizing uh, this right so if you would like uh, that as well uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, do support me um, so in so the two questions I won't take up all the questions um, so I will be taking up the questions uh, for people who have uh, sub uh, subscribed to me uh, for a monthly uh, support uh, support um, and what I'm do going to do is I'm going to go over uh, the solutions for the 10 of the questions but uh, with everyone I am going to be going over these two uh, questions because uh, going forward we will be making developing applications out of these right so um, I'll quickly go over this right so for example let's say you're working for an ISP and that ISP is saving some information some uh, file archiving a uh, network monitoring system information right so what you want to do is first you want to back up that information now before you back up you have to uh, make sure you're matching that file string right so essentially I'm just breaking the problem down uh, without going into too much detail um, so essentially your task is um, so let me read the question so files are backed up with the following name and format every day okay so there's the format um, so write a program which creates a string with the file name of all the days in the months in uh, in a year, right? So it will have all of this, right? So now 
when yeah so that essentially that's what it is i don't want to give too much hints i want you guys to try it uh the second is a website requires a user to input username and password to register write a program to check the validity of the password input by user and the following is the criteria okay so these are the criteria so you have to write a program which uh it's which asks user for input and it makes sure whenever they're entering that uh particular um uh, password it matches all of these uh criteria as well okay um the next thing before we conclude is i wanted to quickly talk about software quality assurance um so of course uh, this i think the picture on the right sums it up <laughs> very nicely is if you write it they will follow right um bugs are there right and bugs are essentially uh some of the things that we haven't thought about that because as users you can try to crash the program in so much so many ways right so those are bugs maybe sometimes the logic breaks sometimes something doesn't work right which is why you have software quality assurance and this is actually a very vast field right it's not just um, uh, about uh, just testing the software it's about the entire management uh, uh, life cycle management of a particular software right so uh taking care of uh, requirements software design coding uh, coding review software configuration testing release management production integration all of this is um, the goal of uh, software quality assurance right so for an example I'll give you guys a hint actually so when you write this okay um, and I know I would say um, 80 to 90 percent of you may make this particular mistake right so let's say you write the code which runs through this right and it writes all the way from January 0 to 31 February 0 to 31 March all August all the way to December to from 0 to 31 right great right now the problem is February it doesn't have 31 right and you have to also take into consideration the leap year when it comes to February right um, so so those are some of the bugs that you will face. There's another bug that you guys will face. I don't want to give that hint away, right? Um, I want you, so we'll, uh, we'll take that up. But these are some of the things that you want to take into consideration. So when you write the code, you want to test it, right? So how you would do it is you, you can, there are different testing frameworks, especially with Python. But before we get into the framework, what you can do is you can, um, you can have some particular input and you can have a particular output, right? And then you can compare those two, whether if that's what, that is what it is that you're expecting, right? So for example, in this code, what you can do is you can write the code so it prints out everything, right? And then you can visually see whether the input output that it's giving, whether it's correct or not, okay? So that's pretty much uh, it for uh, for today. Um, as I said, um, uh, we will be going. I will be taking up uh, all uh, those two particular questions. And what we're going to be doing is when we build our own, uh, when we work on the project, right, our final project, um, right, um, and then when we are making our web application, right. So this is the backend logic that we're working on, right. We will be working on the front end logic as well. So. Uh, we'll be taking up uh, all of those and for those of you who have uh, who are supporting me um, I I, uh, I really appreciate it for those of you who want to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, training or want to follow along make sure every they're understanding everything properly as I said this is not just like a crash course in terms of okay here's the code just practice it no I want to make sure each and every one of you guys are properly understanding so whether you're a network engineer systems engineer or even a beginner uh, software engineer um, you want you want to um i want to make sure that you have the mindset of how to write the code right so i want you guys to take away from this um and for those of you who are supporting me of course i'm going uh, uh extra uh step i really appreciate all your support and you guys are going to be getting uh my one-on-one -on -one support uh when you guys uh support me here uh for a, for a monthly thing um and of course if you get there stuck uh for those of you who are supporting me you can pm me and then we can have uh, a conversation i can help you guys if you guys are stuck anywhere right um and so yeah so please uh do support me um i would really appreciate it uh next week i am going to be uh setting up another system uh which is uh essentially a networking device that you guys will also be configuring just like we uh set up openstack right so for example if you go to sudo upgrade uh, dot com forward slash openstack you'll see openstack running uh there will be another uh link uh, uh the following week uh and over there you'll be configuring uh, routers and switches or other networking devices through um restful apis right so those are some of the experiences that i want to uh, give to you guys right so yeah if you guys have any questions feel free to uh, send me an email here and if you have not registered please do uh, register here okay um and yeah again uh please it will be very 
uh, helpful if you guys are able to support me so I can put out all of this quality content, right? Because I can only do it for so much, right? So if you guys are taking away from it, uh, please do uh, um, uh, consider supporting me, okay? So until, uh, uh, so yeah, that's everything uh, for, uh, for today. Uh, until next time, take care.